Well, hello, everybody. I think, yes, yep, we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first ever live Q&A. We are really putting our destiny in the hands of the internet gods today uh, to see if this works. So I am here, and there is Janine. Say hello, Janine. Hey, guys. So Janine is in, I'm in the reservations office, uh, but Janine is in a very hot and sweltering Chobe at the moment. What sort of temperature are we looking at today, Janine? We're above 40 degrees Celsius and I'm sweating away in the bar. Sweating away in the bar. Well, as soon as we're finished, you can make your way to the bar maybe. I think that's what we can do. Um, so we're I just shall. waiting for other people to join. I see we've got lots of people. We've got people from South Africa, New Hampshire, Huddersfield town in the UK. Benny, is that Benny Vivier? Hi, Benny. How are you doing? Robert Wilson, Maine, USA, UK. Lots of people from the UK. Hello, people. It's my people. Um, so please bear with us. Uh, we might have a few technical glitches. The internet is up and down a little bit today, but I'm sure it'll be good. Um, so welcome. So without further ado, we were had loads and loads of questions coming in. So what we've done is we've sort of bonded them together into rounded questions to give you a more uh, informative time. We're going to whistle through them as fast as we can. No idea how long this is going to take. Um, but let's get started, shall we? So, Janine, are you ready? Totally. Throw Excellent. those questions right. at me. I'm going to be, here we go. It's like a bizarre pub quiz. Right, okay. <laughs> so, um, what I'd like to do before we get started, don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, all of those things that make Google happy. Um, and let's get started. Right. OK. This is a question we always get asked. When is the best time of year to go to the Chobe? Right, Janine, over to you. That is, I'm glad it's the first question because it's the most difficult one of all of them. Um, I personally don't have a favorite time to come to Chobe. The Chobe has so many different seasons, um, creating different climates and different habitats um, that we have all kinds of different wildlife and wildlife behavior breeding behavior throughout the season so in our at the beginning of the year which is our summer um, our our green season we have the water levels rising quite dramatically not because it rains so much here no because um, we get water running down all the way from Angola and the Chobe River is basically a floodplain and floods all the way up um, becoming beautiful, one big level of water and um, growing lots of water lilies. It's green. The elephants love eating the water lilies. They stand in the water and um, graze halfway chest deep in the water. We've got lovely bird life that I'm going to speak about in a little bit. And it's, it's I want to say, almost my favorite time of the year because everything is so green still and animals are very relaxed and have enough food and playful because it's still warm. But obviously, the Chobe is also tremendously active and exciting when it starts drying up a little bit more because it's a water source in a, in a landlocked desert country. So we have so much wildlife around here. And um, a lot of people come to see, especially that, the elephants swimming through the river. Um, throughout the season, when, when the clouds finally start building up again, I think from a photographic perspective, it makes for the most beautiful photography if you have that dark stormy background and the sunlight shining through because we really get full cloud cover it's mostly clouds building up in beautiful formations and i think photographically that's way more interesting than the blue skies we get throughout our dry season so the green season that time of the year provides us with so many babies if you do enjoy your baby baby impalas baby um warthogs the elephants start with getting a lot more babies because they understand they have enough food that time of the year. And it's just so sweet to see those little pink ones with the pink ears coming down to the river after the mom, tiny little things that can hardly reach the mother. So Chobe is wonderful all year round. There we go. That's the main thing. So, so for those of you who don't know that in the Southern Hemisphere, we our seasons are, if you want to remember how the seasons work, they are almost exactly the opposite to the Northern Hemisphere. So when in Botswana, when we have winter, it's it's cooler, but it's drier. And then the summer months is usually when you're having winter, um, but then we also get tend to get more rain, uh, which happens around about there. So if you want to remember which one is which, just think exactly the opposite, very simple. Okay, thank you, Janine, excellent. So the best time of the year to visit the Chobe is all year. 
that's basically what we're saying. This, this is really why we based ourselves there, because there's always something to photograph in the Chogi. Brilliant. Thank you, Jadine. Right, the next question. Similar, but when is the best time of year specifically for bird photography in Botswana? We've got a lot of keen birders asking questions. So what birds are you looking for? So our green season, when it's when it's been summer for a little bit, a lot of birds migrate back to Botswana, is definitely the season we have the most variety of birds. We have beautiful kingfishes, up to seven kingfishes here um, by the Chogu River. And um, stunning amount of weavers coming through, building nests and water birds. So it's fabulous. Many people try to photograph our turbo geese, our little pygmy geese, a tiny little goose that is absolutely phenomenal to photograph, but a real, real challenge. However, it's not the only time of the year to really photograph birds. The storks are coming in our winter, starting in June, and they nest um, in an area that we call the rapids. So we have the trees full of yellow-billed storks, there's open-billed storks, um, there's spoonbills nesting here. So our winter starting in June is full with nesting um, water birds that throughout the year, starting August, September, all learn how to fish in the river. So it's phenomenal to see. It's also the time of the year, starting August, that we get the African skimmer. And there's only a thousand breeding pairs of African skimmers left on this planet. And they come here to breed on our sandbanks. A little bit earlier in the year, around May, June, we get the pike kingfishers nesting in our riverbanks in big numbers. So, so you can be guaranteed some excellent pike kingfishers in flight shots. And then later on, um, when it starts turning green again, our woodland kingfisher is returning. He always announces our first rain. And when you live here in Botswana, there is nothing more beautiful than hearing that sound because by that time it's so, so dry that the animals have nothing left to feed on. And it's just such a relief. So if you do enjoy your bird life, there's a lot of different birds throughout the year. And um, you need to see which type of birds is your priority. Brilliant. Um, we had a question. So green here from Brant Smith, which was so green season is winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Yes, we're about to enter. The rains are about to arrive. Green yeah. season, we also call it birding season. That's about to start now. So it's lovely. It's warm. It's lush. It's green. If you want to escape the uh, the, the long, the short, short days of, uh, of winter in the Northern Hemisphere, now's the time to come. So, uh, yes. yeah, if you want to come and check it out. Okay. Well, what I would do is I would share some images of birds from the Chobe. Um, this is on a gallery on our website. I will share a link to this um, so that you can check it out a little bit later on. Uh, we've got lots of amazing images in there of all the different species that you'll see in the Chobe. Um, okay, on to the next question. Um, right, how much photo instruction does Pangolin provide versus wildlife information? All righty. That depends a little bit on the dynamics of the group that we're having. If we have first time Africa lovers, people that come to experience nature, obviously we provide a little bit more information. You must understand we always have a guide and a photographer on the boat. So our guides are there to answer any wildlife related questions that you do have. However, if you are um, more into the photography side of things, we have a lot of photography talk going on. You need to understand, though, that a lot of the photography talk is anticipating wildlife behavior. That's what gets you the shots. So understanding the animal in the first place is what gets you the best photographs. We get a lot of non-photographers coming with us. If you're not just a ticker, somebody that wants to see A, B, C, D, E, but you actually want to experience nature, anybody is enjoying our trips because we actually spend some time with the animals that we photograph um, and learn about them while we watch them. Um, we had a question from uh, John Norden said, uh, I really want to come and bring my wife, but she isn't a photographer. Are there things that she can do? Yes. Come on, um, safari. Come on, safari. This is still a wildlife experience. You know, you, yeah. it's very unhurried wildlife experience as well. So you'll spend lots of time looking at the animals, being with the animals. It's very serene. You're not racing around on a, on a Ferrari safari trying to find the big five. But also... We do supply cameras. So uh, yeah, John, your non-photographer wife will be given a camera should she so wish. 
And uh, the danger there lies is when she suddenly starts taking far better photographs and that, that becomes a little bit awkward. So <laughs> there's always that danger, but we have a lot of partners, husbands and wives who aren't the photographers and they have an amazing time. It, it's still very much a wildlife experience. Yeah, as long as she enjoys nature, she is in the right hands with us because she is going to get to see the best that's out there. And most so far haven't had somebody who refuses the camera, they at least give it a try at the beginning. And many people say, you know what, I just rather experience the whole thing. I want to watch the whole thing because I feel I miss something when I look through the lens. I always say there's a time and place for everything. There is scenes when you have 600 elephants at once. Yeah, you can't photograph that. Sit back, watch it, take it in and all. And then in that, there is so much, so many little stories happening. And even for somebody who doesn't do photography, Having a 600 mil lens plus a crop sensor, watching at a malachite, looking at a malachite kingfisher, it just looks amazing. You could never see that without it. Freeze the moments that are, are special. Sometimes people really enjoy it. Very true. Okay, on to the next question. Right. Oh, this is this is a big one. This is this is a conversation we get around the campfire all the time. Do predators, yeah. we're obviously referring to maybe lions and leopards really not see you as a human when you're on a safari vehicle. Janine, what do you think? All right. Um, well, they, they definitely do see you. I've been in a steering contest with a lion or two. They know 100% that you're there. So the, the truth is they have gotten very, very used to game viewing vehicles or boats here on the Toby River. They haven't been hunted by them and they haven't had any bad experiences with these vehicles. So humans within a structure, um, whether it be the, the patio of your tent that has a balcony or the boat or a, a car, um, animals know that you're there, but they sort of see you as one entity and they know there is no threat. That doesn't mean you shouldn't break the silhouette of that vehicle or the boat, because reason being, they're not used to that. It suddenly looks diff different than before, something that they might not expect, and most likely they will run away. So I've had a wonderful guest on my boat once. We watched lions drinking from the river, which is a phenomenal experience because you're on eye level with them. And he got a bit overexcited and jumped up. Bravo! And the line was gone. So um, the human shape or, or any sort of different shape to, to what they see on a daily basis does make them run for the most part. They are wild animals. And um, yeah, that's why you're supposed to keep, keep your profile low within a safari vehicle and your voice. And your voice, yeah. Even when you're shouting with excitement. Yes, definitely. That's one. Okay, what tips do you have for wildlife photography on safari at night? Perhaps you should clarify where you do night drives and uh, where you don't. Okay, I shall. Um, Chobe is not the best place for wildlife night photography. Chobe is a national park, and like many national parks, has therefore more rules and regulations, like let's say the Yellowstone National Park. And in Chobe, um, you have to have be back at a certain time and you're only allowed to enter at a certain time in the morning. So night activities are completely out of the question, which is sad in a way, but we do get um, quite a few visitors. So it, it's good for the park. Also from a company perspective, we do not allow any flash photography. I know it's a fine line to walk and there might be scenarios um, where flash isn't harmful, but there is scenarios where it's very disruptive for the wildlife. So we just drew the line and said, none of that. If you do enjoy your night photography, when you come into the Delta with us or the Kalahari private concessions, night activities are allowed and can be done. However, photography can be slightly challenging. Usually we have a spotlight with, often with a red filter on top so we don't blind the animals. So what we do is we search with the spotlight to see and look for eyes. Um, and if we find something interesting, we put the red filter on it so we can hold it onto the animal for a longer duration. On a slow shutter speed with a bean bag, you can get some shots and in a raw file, you can fix the red light afterwards. However, you need to shoot very slow. I 
read the question what to do at a waterhole. Best would be a tripod at a waterhole. That isn't the scenario here in Toby or even in the Delta. That wouldn't be the case. Um, so that you can bring your shutter speeds as low as possible. We need to hope, however, that your animal is standing dead still, frozen, because it doesn't help you if you're stabilized and your animal moves. So action photography at night um, with a normal um, mirrorless or DSLR camera just doesn't take place. Perfect. That's it. That's very comprehensive. Okay. Um, these are the rest of this section. So we've got three sort of sections. One, which is about where to go, when, how to, you know, where are the destinations, what can you expect to see? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about, I've got a few questions related to COVID-19, not too many, I want to keep this light, but there are questions being asked. And then at the end, um, Janine is going to answer a whole load of more technical wildlife photography questions. So if that's what you're really after, and I can see some questions popping up on that, don't worry, they are coming, the, uh, the, the technical questions are coming. Um, okay, so Janine, uh, how can I see the greatest variety of animals to photograph on one trip? Hmm. That's a very good question to ask. Um, in my eyes, I think to do that, you need to try and visit as many different habitats as possible throughout your safari. So if you visit Botswana, we have three main habitats here, which is um, the very northern part, the Chobe, where you have that big piece of water flowing attracting tons of wildlife so the the river is what it is all about here and then we obviously have the Okavango delta um, one of the heritage sites and the delta is absolutely beautiful and uh, if i could have a house there i'd move there right away one of the most magical places you must understand there's no fences and hundreds of miles people can migrate from the chobe into the delta with no problem and you can off-road, it's much easier to track um, for predators. We have a large number of wild dog, um, but the wild dog population is very high in the Delta. Um, we have better chances for zebras there. And then last but not least, we obviously have desert because two thirds of Botswana consists out of the Kalahari Desert, which because it covers such a large area of Botswana actually has versatile um, multiple habitats in its own. There's salt pans and there's low shrublands and there's sand. And um, we offer a safari that goes all the way through the Delta into the Kalahari. And there it's all about the waterhole photography because things are dry and the animals need to come and drink at the one and only or the few water sources there are. And you get a whole different load of wildlife again, such as oryx, which you would never see in, in the Chobe. Perfect. Okay. Uh, we've actually just had a comment now from Nadine. Uh, who is going to be visiting us on October the 22nd. So two well, weeks, less than two weeks. Wants to know uh, to what, can we, yeah, what can we expect of animals and weather? Well, the, the weather one's easy. It's going to be hot. <laughs> it's going to be very hot. October is our hot. Hot, hottest month, hottest and driest month, even though we had our first rain, astonishingly enough, oh, wow. on Independence Day, on Botswana's birthday, and here in Botswana, people believe it rains on Independence Day. It's going to be a very good rainy season, which is good for the wildlife because it means that there will be enough food available for the next dry season to come. So what can you expect? It's going to be hot. It's going to be dry. Um, maybe take a bit of eye drops with if you if you <laughs> it's very dry and you're going to see tons of animals coming to the river because the, it's the only water source in many, many, many hundred miles that there is. There's um, tons of elephants that swim across to try and get to grazing plains. It's tons of buffalo, water buck. Um, we have a very high concentration of fish eagle on this river. The carmine bee eaters are starting to arrive this time of the year. And because it's hot, they like to bathe in the river. Um, so you have a, a very good chances for a great variety of wildlife. I think, I think October and November are, you know, some people call it shoulder season. It's a bit of a forgotten season, but if you can, if you can bear the heat, I mean, it is hot, but the wildlife viewing is amazing. So yeah, we would uh, strongly suggest it. October, November, great time to come. I think we had a question from uh, Ramesh wanting to know the best time for bird and wildlife photography. October, November is amazing. Really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, great. yeah. Now, now Ramesh, get on the plane. I think if you're coming from, it sounds like you might be coming from the Indian subcontinent, you'll be fine. You'll be fine with the E. Okay, 
Um, we had a couple of questions um, regarding COVID protocols, which we'd like to just quickly address. I'm just going to whistle through these because it's very quick. But what are the current COVID-19 related requirements for entry into Botswana? So it's really simple. You have to have a PCR test within 72 hours of, um, of arrival, um, which I know sometimes can be challenging from further away, maybe West Coast USA, uh, but you can get here in time and do that. Um, when you arrive at the airports or even the land borders, if you're coming across from Victoria Falls, they do a rapid flow test um, at the border as well, uh, which takes half an hour, 45 minutes, doesn't really encumber you. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Botswana is doing really well at the moment as far as controlling COVID. So um, yeah, it, it's not too difficult. There aren't any restrictions. There's no quarantine. There's no red list, no travel lists or anything like that. So uh, yeah, it's pretty simple getting here. Um, people were asking, what protocols do we have in place? We have a lot um, of protocols in place and we've actually updated a blog post, uh, which has got all of those details. So I'm not going to bore you with it now. They do change a lot based on World Health Organization guidelines and also guidelines from the Department of Tourism in Botswana. So that's in a blog post and I will leave that in a link down below. Uh, people wanted to know about PCR testing when they leave, because obviously going back into most countries, they will require PCR testing as well. I am very pleased to say that we have in the Chobe our very own PCR testing station and uh, their turnaround time is pretty quick at the moment. Sometimes we get it back same day. So that's really cool. Um, if you are in remote locations like the Kalahari or the Okavango Delta, then quite frankly, the coolest, coolest way you could ever have a PCR test is um, there is a helicopter service which will fly in, land next to you wherever you are having a safari or a sundown or also, maybe not a sundown, they're still going to get back. A nurse will get out of the helicopter, come and uh, put that thing up your nose, do your PCR test, clear out the nostrils a little bit, maybe from the dusty game drive and uh, go back to Mound, and then when you fly out of Mound, your PCR test is waiting for you. There is a bit of a charge for that, but it does stop you having to then overnight somewhere to have a PCR test. So again, we can advise you, all you need to do is speak to my travel advisors. They are, there's a link down below to contact them as well. Um, lastly, there was a question, how do I get to the Chobe? Now, I've done a map, so you can see, and if I do this very quickly, there we go. This is my impromptu map. Um, as you see on the middle there, number one is Kasani. That's where the Chobe is. So there are loads of ways to fly in. The most popular way is to come in via Johannesburg, which is number three. You may well fly from Johannesburg to Kasani, maybe to the Chobe Delta Kalahari Safari that um, the Janine was talking about, at which point you will end in Maun and probably fly back to Johannesburg. Other alternative routes, which are really interesting, is Kenya Airways and Ethiopian Airways are really good. You can fly into them from most of Europe, North America, Far East, uh, Middle East, and then you connect down into Victoria Falls and Livingston, which are opposite the river on each other, um, which is uh, a really easy way to get in as well. So when you're looking at the traditional airlines like British Airways, um, South African Airways, uh, Emirates and that sort of thing, also look at Kenyan and Ethiopian. That's a good way to go. And I do believe that United Airlines have just signed a code share agreement with Airlink, which is the flight that we take from Johannesburg into um, Kasani, into the Chobe. So check out those as well. That means you make one booking, check your bags all the way through, super simple. And then if you want to add on Cape Town at the end, you can fly Cape Town out or Johannesburg out back on United. So loads of options. One which is not necessarily COVID related, but inconvenience or illness related. Should I be concerned about biting insects and malaria? The simple answer to that is no. Obviously in the wetter months, there'll be more insects around. There are mosquitoes around. Malaria is nowhere near the problem that it was 20 years ago. Um, it, I mean, Janine, have you heard of anybody who's been on a trip with us since we started who's got malaria? Never. None of my colleagues, none of our staff, um, none of our guests has ever gotten malaria. Um, I get bitten in the rainy season, but it's no problem. I'm not even worried. I, I think the, the, the rule is, you know, be sensible. And if you wear long sleeves, long trousers in the evening times, dash on a bit of uh, mozzie spray and, uh, and you'll be fine. 
you know, and, and also if you start to get flu-like symptoms, it's a very quick test. It's a fingerprint test to figure out if you've got malaria or not. And if you get it early, it's really easy, really easy to treat. Um, so there we go. So that's it. Just checking the questions. Um, how does someone get to you from North America? I hope that I've answered that one. Lots of places. Um, I'll be there late April into May and visiting all three areas, including the Kalahari. Is it still green at that time? That's from Lynn. Um, yeah, it is a little bit green around the place. It, the greenery does disappear. It's beautiful, quite though. So, so what you do is actually you've got a fine balance. You're slightly thinning out grass, which makes it easy to find everything. So it's a lovely, lovely time of year. Really nice. Um, and I don't know if you're adding in Victoria Falls, but April, May is when we've got full-on flood um, on Victoria Falls. So really dramatic Victoria Falls as well. Um, are we planning? Oh, we weren't planning. We aren't planning on going to the Kalahari, but to Mashatu. Does that fit well with the Chobian Delta? Yes. Obviously, Mashatu has a really famous hide. Getting there is a little bit tricky, or we seem to have lost Janine. I'll keep on talking. Um, getting to Mashatu is um, a little bit, uh, oh, she's back, um, is a little bit tricky. It's quite a long flight, but you have to go from Mound. So that is possible. You can add it in, but then you have to come back to Mound or go to Johannesburg. Uh, we'll have to investigate how easy it is to get a PCR test in Mashatu to then go straight to Johannesburg. If you want to contact uh, my uh, safari planners and ask them, pick their brains, they are more better equipped to answer that. Lots of questions coming in. What do you do if it rains the whole day with regards to game drives? That's from Benny. It very rarely rains all day. I Lightroom. Uh, sorry, Janine. Lightroom. So as you said, Lightroom. As you yeah. said, it doesn't it doesn't really rain all day. We managed to do our safaris around the rain. We might shift uh, activity for, for 45 minutes or so, waiting for a big storm to pass. Most of the time, it's tropical storms, and they come and they go. If you, I, I never say never. If you really hit one of these rainy days, um, then then we do some post-production, some editing. Um, we hold presentations. There's still loads of information we can pass on, um, even if we're not able to go on the boats. Perfect. Very rare. Okay, uh, there's another quick question. Do we have Tetsi flies? Not that I've seen for a long time. No Tetsi flies as far as I'm aware. Um, no, no I, the only time I found Tetsi flies was in Eastern Zambia, down sort of like Lower Zambezi, yeah. but I haven't seen any in Botswana. So no. Wangi, no I right. think has. Okay, we're off the, uh, oh, somebody was asking about snakes as well. Do we have snakes? Can we avoid snakes? Again, we hardly ever see snakes. Snakes here is coming and they get out of the way. It's it's not a problem. Um, we don't really have an issue yeah. with snakes. No, no, we've had no problems with snakes, no encounters with snakes. Again, you just, you know, if you see a snake, you stay still, it moves away. They've got no interest in us, quite frankly. You, okay. you, don't, see, you don't see them. Okay, Janine, we are now into the bit I think that everyone's been waiting for. Here we go. The technical questions about photography. We'll get there in the end. Right, okie dokie. It's a big one. Which is better for a safari, a crop or a full frame sensor? All right. Um, so you will hear me say a lot. It depends because it really does on, on your personal priorities, on your budget, on how much you want to carry. All these sort of things are related to, to all the gear questions pretty much. So it depends. In, on, the safari, on, um, on the safari activities, a lot of action goes down in low light during dusk or dawn. Um, because that's when the heat calms down, that's when the predators are most active. And um, very often that's when the light is the prettiest. The golden hour is beautiful, but doesn't provide you with the most light. So crop sensors and low megapixel sensors are often much better in low light scenarios. They have much less noise. And that is because our pixels are much larger and can absorb light much better. So normally for that reason alone, I would go for a full frame sensor. However, if you have um, weight restrictions, travel-wise or even physically, and you really don't want to lug all that heavy camera gear around, you might want to opt for a crop sensor because that way you still get the focal range, you get the reach that you actually need on Safari. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to carry that much lens around. So crop sensors are very, very practical and there's some fantastic crop sensor bodies out there. Um, personally, I prefer the full frames, though. Brilliant. Okay. Um, next question was, what are the optimal focal lengths or reach for a photo safari? 
If you come to the Toby, the optimal focal length is up to 600 millimeter in length or even a little larger. Reason being, we can often not decide how far we are from an animal. On the river, we're obviously restricted by where the water flows, but even on land, we have to stay on the roads. So we have to work with what there is. And being flexible, also sometimes zooming back, is very helpful. We also look a lot at smaller things such as kingfishers, which are absolutely beautiful if you have enough focal range. So the most common lenses that we get here is a lot the 150 to 600 mil, or there's a 200, 500, 200, 600, depending what brand you have. Having 600 mil is amazing. There's obviously the good old 100 to 400 and the 80 to 400 from Nikon and Canon. They are fantastic cameras, especially if you have them on a crop sensor. I find that 400 mil though often falls just a tad short. I shoot on a 400 mil myself and sometimes I feel I would like that extra little bit of reach. If you have the choice, um, let's say between a 300 and a 500 millimeter fix, go for the 500 please. Bring the longer lens with. In the Delta, in the Kalahari, where we can offer it because because it's a private concession, we can control a little bit better how far we can distance ourselves from the animal. But please be reminded, at the end, it's wildlife, and we can't always choose how close they let us come. Um, we've got a question here from Ted, which is, when you say low light, um, ISO 6400 maximum, is that good enough at most times? Yeah, definitely good enough at most times. I happen to shoot even higher sometimes, but for the most part, you should be good with that. I want to say 90%, 95% of the time that will cover you just fine. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, next lens-related question is, is there a lens that's good for both portraiture and wildlife? I presume this is somebody who is maybe doing a, like a hybrid holiday with a bit of maybe street portraiture type stuff, maybe in Cape Town or, and then trying to combine it and thinking, is there a sweet spot? Is there one lens that will do it all? I'm going to have to disappoint you on this one. And I would say, no, there isn't. And that's why photography is such an expensive hobby because you can never have enough gear. So you could maybe say that 100 to 400 or 80 to 400 can also be used for portraiture. I've done that before myself, but it's not ideal because you also need a certain distance to your subject very often to focus on. Um, so not really. My favorite portrait lenses are the 2470 2.8 and the 70 200, especially because I personally don't like to stand right in front of somebody's face. And the 70 200 2.8 is a fantastic portrait lens. Not long enough for wildlife, though. And even with a two times converter, I yes, you get to 400, but even 400 is often a bit short. And I'm not the biggest fan of converters or extenders on zoom lenses. They work quite well on fixed lenses, though. Cool. Thank you. OK. Do I require a second body on Safari or can I swap lenses? We should tell people who are new to photography, we're talking about camera bodies here, obviously. We're not <laughs> suggesting any type of body swapping. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, I'm not so much into that, but yeah. <laughs> with the cameras, if you have um, the opportunity and the option to carry an extra body, please do so. Very often, if you travel with a fixed lens, you want to have a zoom lens mounted on the other side so you have the flexibility um, next to your high quality. Or you might want to bring a shorter wide angle lens. I love um, carrying a 2470 or even a 1635 with for some landscape photography on a second body. In Chobe, our wildlife is extremely calm, and we sometimes have the opportunity to go right underneath an elephant, especially with the bulls. We don't push it if they don't want it, but sometimes they come close to us while they're grazing. And it's a beautiful, hair-raising, magical situation, and you want to have your camera right there with a the wide angle on to capture it. So, so it's two reasons why you don't want to be swapping lenses in these scenarios. Number one, we have a very dusty environment and you want to try and minimize swapping lenses as much as possible so you don't get dirt on your sensor. But number two is most of the time these scenarios pop up rather unexpected and it takes you quite a while to change the lens, to fiddle around and most of the time you would have lost your photograph by that time. So if you have two bodies, take them. 
Perfect. Okie dokie. Um, we had another question here. On a pangolin safari, do you provide lenses from Sue? Uh, the long and the short of it is, yes, we do have lenses. We supply cameras. We currently have Canon cameras and Sigma lenses for the Canon mount. So if you have a Canon camera, you can use one of our lenses. You can use it with the body. Um, then that's fine. If you join, for example, one of our hosted safaris like Best of Chobi or Chobi Delta Kalahari, where you're traveling with somebody like Janine, then we will take cameras all the way through that. Um, even if we go down to the Kalahari, if you don't have a camera and a lens, we will take that for you and you can use it throughout. But we always have lenses and cameras available at the Pangolin Chobi Hotel and the Pangolin Photo Camp in the Okavango Delta. Um, oh, this is a good one. Ajit, is drone photography allowed? Nope. <laughs> Sorry. It's um, you have to have a very, very difficult to come by license to do drone photography. Um, and we think it's also a good idea because if suddenly you're trying to enjoy a bit of wildlife and a bit of sanctity, and then suddenly you have an, a, a swarm of drones coming over the elephants, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. So no, I'm afraid leave your drone at home. Um, you're not going to really be able to use it here at all. Um, elephants do don't you, like it at all. No, I can remember. Well, elephants don't like bees. So it freaks yeah, them out. Like it's not it a good all. thing. So they hear bees and then they get really unsettled. The reason, so the reason they you? actually don't want it, and it's a very good reason, is because um, that way they can control poaching better. If drones were allowed and multiple drones would be in the sky at all times, poachers can easily seek out animals in the bush. And that's why they keep drone usage to an absolute minimum. Yeah. Um, there was also a question going back to what you said before, Janine. Do you have a preference for a 1.4 or 2 converter with the 100 400 lens? Okay, that's a good question. I would prefer the 1.4 converter. I have it myself, and every once in a while I make use of it. Reason being, you um, don't stop down quite as much. You go to an F8 on most, um, yeah, with 100 to 400, you go to an F8, which you can still work with quite well. Um, if you close down your aperture even more, you start really raising your eyes so extremely high. And also the quality of your shots isn't that much guaranteed anymore. Personally, I only like to use extenders when you are needing just that extra little bit of reach to get detail. When something is really out of your reach, even with an extender, you're not going to get a decent photograph because the quality with the extender isn't really good enough to to make that far away animal come out great um another question they're coming in thick and fast i saw a lovely video by you guys about going on a trip to photograph the night sky can this be combined with a wildlife safari um ajit yes now that you can't bring your drone but you can do star photography so that's good so actually if you go on our website and look at the chobi delta kalahari packages all of those are scheduled when it's a new moon. So when you leave the Chobe and you go down into the Delta and the Kalahari, where there is next to no light pollution at all, we have several places where we can go and do uh, night photography as well. So yes, that was, I thought I'd quickly answer that question. We do night photography. We also have an amazing baobab tree in the Chobe as well, but if the weather conditions are right, we go from the hotel to go there, but we, it has to be perfect for that sort of condition. Okie dokie, uh, next question. Oh, I like this one. Right, Janine, can I travel with my camera gear as hand luggage? That's a good one. It depends on how creative you are. Creative with your packing and creative at the airport. Um, no, all jokes aside, definitely, yes, you can. As long as your camera bag fits size-wise the overhead compartment restrictions. So it shouldn't exceed those. Weight-wise, most international airlines are very lenient with camera gear. If you tell them that's camera gear, they can't be checked in. They're usually okay with it. But my tip is, don't make it look like it's as heavy as what it is. Um, breeze it off while you check in and go through to your boarding process um, as if it's nothing and they won't stop you as long as you are within the right size restrictions. When you have a charter flight, however, let's say, from Nairobi or from Kasani into a more remote area, please limit yourself to the weight restrictions that is being given to you as an overall weight. Reason being, these smaller planes really struggle taking off if you exceed the weight restrictions and you don't want to risk anything. Um, on that note, just to add to that, make sure you don't bring a hard case. Don't travel with your camera gear in a Pelican case as well. 
that might give the airlines an excuse to say, well, you can check that, it's going to be protected. But also when you get onto the charter flights, the luggage underneath is, is very small, the opening. So soft bags only. Make sure that when you bring your camera gear, wear a, have it as a rucksack. Stride up to check in, looking strong with it. Lock eyes with the person there and check in and you'll be absolutely fine. Um, we don't, we've never really had any issues. We've got a fantastic relationship with the charter operators in Botswana um, and they, they often cut us some slack. So don't overdo it, but yeah, no hard cases and uh, look strong. There we go. That's the advice. Um, we've got some more technical questions, but I'm aware of the time, so I want to move on. Um, the, we'll see if we can answer some at the end. The next question is, is it still worthwhile investing in DSLRs such as the Canon 5D Mark IV? Definitely, I would say so. I know the Marilla's world is pressing, pressing forward fast, but there is some amazing deals with DSLRs at the moment. And um, from a Canon perspective, the 1DX series and the 5D series were absolutely beautiful cameras. So if you have a good set of great lenses at home for them, I would say yes, definitely. I find even that the they might be lacking the animal eye tracking, but I find that the single point focus on the 1DX and 5D is still more reliable, especially when it comes to low light conditions and when it comes to shooting into the sun the mirrorless cameras of all sorts struggle a bit more so there's nothing wrong with dslr cameras for now i think eventually you will want the extra software upgrades and when the animal eye tracking function becomes a bit more reliable over a wide variety of different species then you will eventually invest in mirrorless that's where the world goes to but for the next few years i think dslrs are still great I think we could do a whole new thing about DSLR versus mirrorless, can't we? So let's let's leave that one for the moment. Otherwise, we'll have people here all night. Okay, a couple more questions coming in. Uh, do we have any Nikon equipment? Uh, not at the moment, but we are planning on getting some telephoto lenses for Nikon mounts. So next year, we, we should have some of those. Um, somebody's asking, I have a uh, Canon EOS 7D Mark II. I've got one of those too. Brilliant camera. Should I invest in lenses or another body? Ooh. That's a good one. So our 150 to 600 millimeter Sigma lenses will fit your 7D body just fine. And that will give you nearly a thousand millimeters, which is fantastic. If you would like to travel with a with another body, a full frame body out of whatever reason and a shorter lens, that is up to you for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But we will have you taken care of with a um, long focal lens on this end. Perfect. There are some technical questions about the R5 and the R6. We've got some videos about that. Um, if you would like to drop us a mail, get in contact with us. I'm not going to put Janine just on the spot now. It's about settings. And I know you're a big fan of the R6, but uh, I'm not going to drop those in just yet. We've got time for one more question. Uh, Janine doesn't know about this question. This is a surprise question for Janine now. Here we go. So Janine, if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? Huh. You're Imagine traveling suddenly opening up. Yeah, I'm in a pretty great place myself. Can't, can't complain. That's a difficult one. I have so much on my bucket list at the moment. I must admit, there's a lot of destinations. But my little nephew, Leo, was born yesterday. Oh. Now became an, became an aunt again. And I must say, I would love to go and see him in the United States. So the I United think. States. Well, like, Family like comes earlier, first. Oh, of course, yes. Well, like I said earlier, so we're expecting the UK to drop their red list with Southern Africa tomorrow. The USA has taken South Africa off, off the naughty step. Botswana always follows South Africa. So whatever they, whatever they mention South Africa, Botswana will, will follow that as well. Um, so, yeah, so we, we're expecting travel. I can see it now. So many more inquiries. 2022 is going to be super busy, so don't miss out. I put details to all of our safaris in the comments down below. Please come and join us. Send us any questions. We are happy to do a Zoom call with anybody. I will jump on it. My staff will jump on it, and we will answer all your questions. And, uh, well, I, you know what? I can actually see light at the end of the tunnel. I'm actually breaking out of the tunnel now. I think we're there. I think we can safely say we're there. Um, yeah. Guys, I was watching the numbers of people who are watching this, and we hit 170 of people or something watching this. Wow, that went well. We lost Janine briefly. But we're doing well. How are you feeling, Janine? Was that you? Doing you good. Have you got a gin and tonic? I'm going, in, 
<laughs> no, I'm going. I'm going for the pool now. You're going for the pool. Good idea. Cool off. Thank you so much to everybody for joining. Um, this video will be posted. Please share it with all your friends. Um, if you want to get a hold of us, please do so. You know where we are. We look forward to seeing you in the Chobi. Before I go, there are loads of specials on our website for the next five months up until the end of March. Come and get them while they're hot and they're running out fast as well. So thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to end the broadcast. You got any more questions? No, no more questions. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Trying to stop it.